Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. So the time has finally come. If you didn't catch the announcement in the last video, then I have some exciting news to share with you. The electric dirt bike build starts this week, and I'm collaborating with Golden Motor to make it happen. This video will serve as an introduction to the build series, where I show and talk about the design specs, and wire up the electric powertrain for a quick bench test to make sure everything works before I start bending tubing around it. But before we start, I just want to take a minute to thank my longtime subscribers for sticking around and putting up with all the product reviews over the past couple of years, while I built up a decent tool and equipment inventory to help make these projects for you. I do appreciate your understanding, and I promise that we're turning a new page with this series. I do have a couple more reviews to knock off the list, but they're coming to an end this fall. I've accomplished my goal, and now it's time to get back to work on the OG content. With that said, let's take a look at the original plan for this project. A lot of you might remember that I shared this design with you back in 2023. This was intended to be a lightweight trail bike, similar to the Chiron Light BX in power and weight. I planned on using an early version of the 5 to 10 kW QS165 three phase permanent magnet synchronous motor, which was released as an aftermarket upgrade for the Chiron Light B right around the same time that I drew this model up. And I was going to pair it with a FireDriver encoder speed controller and power them with a 3 kW 72 volt lithium NMC battery, which would have provided around 80 to 100 km of range per charge at an average speed of 40 to 50 km an hour, a top speed of around 75 km an hour, and around 280 Newton meters of torque at the wheel using a 7 to 1 gear ratio. I planned on a trellis tube chassis using 1 inch DOM steel to help keep the total curb weight at around 120 pounds without spending thousands of dollars on machining a mold for die casting aluminum, since it is just a one off home built machine and not a production bike. The fully adjustable 790mm front forks and 240mm rear shock with progressive linkage would provide around 200mm of travel front and back, and together with a set of 19 inch wheels, they would produce a ground clearance of around 11.5 inches. The wheelbase is set to 52 inches, and the rake angle is 25.5 degrees for a happy medium between stability and maneuverability on the trail. I'm still considering building this bike, but Golden Motor reached out a few weeks ago and wanted to collaborate on a project using one of their electric powertrain kits with twice as much power, so I took them up on the opportunity to save some money and build something bigger in this series instead. I figured you folks would be more interested in that anyway. I don't have every detail finished, but I've got the chassis and suspension worked out for the new design so we can get started on the build. It's similar to the original, with some modifications to accommodate a larger 10-20kW to 20 kilowatt peak motor and controller kit, and it incorporates a two-stage transmission with a 10.4 to 1 gear ratio to produce over 300Nm of torque at the wheel and a max speed of around 75km an hour. The jack shaft for the transmission also serves as the pivot shaft for the swing arm to save space and keep things as simple as possible. Again, similar to the Chiron, except I'm mounting my sprockets on the outside of the frame for easier maintenance. I'm sticking with the same 790mm front forks, but using a 330mm rear shock and a slightly different progressive linkage geometry for a bit smoother ride while maintaining the same 200mm of travel front and back. The wheelbase will be 2 inches longer at 54 inches, and ground clearance will increase to roughly 12 inches, and the total curb weight will increase to around 190 pounds with the larger motor, frame, and an extra kilowatt hour of battery capacity to maintain around 100 kilometers of range. The motor that Golden Motors sent is their HPM 10 kilowatt continuous 20 kilowatt peak three phase dual stator permanent magnet synchronous motor. It's available in 48, 72, 96, and 120 volt air and liquid cool versions rated for up to 6,000 RPM and 40 Newton meters of torque. This motor in particular is their air cooled model that's wired for 72 volts and will output a max 30.6 Newton meters of torque at 3,800 RPM with an average efficiency of around 91%. The speed controller that they sent is their EZB72800, which is a sine wave controller that uses field oriented control for smoother operation and better efficiency than other types of controllers. It's available in versions ranging from 48 to 240 volts DC to handle up to 40 kilowatts of power, and they all feature liquid cooled heat sinks, regen braking, three speed and cruise modes, and they're fully programmable with built in Bluetooth and CAN bus support, although there is no programming required with their self calibrating feature when paired with one of their proprietary motors. It's literally a plug and play kit as you're about to see. This controller in particular is their B series and is rated for 72 volts nominal, 800 amps max phase current, and 400 amps of max battery current. I put links for the motor and controller in the video description in case you're interested. With that out of the way, let's get this kit wired up to a battery and make sure it works. This is a diagram showing how I connected everything. I first started by connecting the motor phase wires to the controller. 
As mentioned, it's a three-phase dual stator motor, so there are six phase leads in total, and you just pair them up and connect them to the terminals on the controller with the corresponding color code. Next, I connected the harnesses for the comms and controls, then wired the supplied connectors to the controls that I used for this test. Most of you are probably aware of how these connectors go together, but I'll explain anyway for the beginners. The red grommet slips over the wire insulation after you strip it back about 5mm, and the pin is then crypt over the bare wire and the grommet to keep the grommet from falling out of place after the pin is inserted into the connector. The holes in the connector have a tab that locks into the pin, but there will still be some movement until the red clip is installed on the end. The controls that I used for this bench test were a couple of rocker switches for the reverse switch and a substitute for the key switch which hasn't been delivered yet, as well as a hall throttle. Next, I connected one of the motor's two hall sensors and then wired up a 400 amp main contactor for turning power on and off to the controller. I also used a precharge resistor across the main contacts which slowly precharges the capacitors in the controller before the key switch activates the coil in the contactor, otherwise the rush of high current after turning on the key switch could cause damage to the contacts, permanently weld them together, or even damage the controller. The connector for the key switch has a wire with a large ring connector which connects to the main A2 terminal on the contactor and another wire needs to be spliced to the second wire in the switch connector, which would then be connected to the A2 coil terminal, and the lone grey wire coming from the controller harness connects to the A1 coil terminal. With the components wired up, I then connected the battery, which is just a Headway Super Beast pack that I reconfigured from 24 volts to 72 volts, and incorporated a 250 amp daily BMS. It's powerful, but it's only a 14 amp hour pack, so I just use it for quick bench tests like this in the shop. After turning on the key switch, you should hear the contactor close the contacts to power up the controller, and you should hear just one beep from the controller. If you hear more than one beep, then you have an error to deal with. Thankfully everything powered up fine, so I went ahead and gave it some throttle to see what happened. It seemed to work fine and forward, so I turned on the reverse switch and applied the throttle again. This time the RPM was lower, but that's typical for reverse because it doesn't need to be as fast or as torquey as forward gear, though these can be adjusted in the controller through their Easy Control app to perform as you wish. After signing into the app, we're taken to a monitoring screen that displays basic information like voltage, RPM, battery and phase current, vehicle speed, etc, and throttle data is displayed below that. Testing the motor again shows there's very little to no lag in the meters, so you get accurate real-time data during operation. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
Of course, the speedometer needs to be calibrated according to your vehicle specs, like tire diameter and gear ratio, so that it displays properly, which can be done in the settings. If we open the settings, we see loads of options that can be changed or fine-tuned to your preference. From under and over voltage and over current protection, to sensors, motor parameters, speed, torque, and throttle response. For example, you can switch between linear, comfort, and sport mode, which determines how much torque is output for a given amount of throttle input, as shown in the graph where the exponential curve represents comfort mode and torque is applied slowly with throttle input. The logarithmic curve represents sport mode, which applies a lot of torque quickly relative to throttle input, and linear is the happy medium for general use. To apply a change in settings, you need to click the update button after making the change, then the controller will reboot itself and it's ready to go. As mentioned, other features include the self-calibration, which saves you loads of time manually adjusting and fine-tuning these settings, as well as regenerative braking and flux weakening if you want to squeeze a bit more speed out of the system. But I'm going to wait to play around with those settings once the bike is ready for a test drive, and wrap this video up here so I can get to work bending some tubes. If you have any thoughts about this powertrain, or suggestions for the project, I'd love to read them in the comments below. Like past projects, this will be done in a series of 5 or 6 videos, with the last video featuring a condensed version of the complete build and a test ride for performance and battery range. By the time you watch this, I've already started the chassis, and I should have that episode ready to publish in about a week or so. I'm going to try to have an episode published about every two weeks. I can't guarantee that will be the case for every episode, as I'm still hunting down components to build the battery, but that's the plan anyway. So until the next one, take care and thanks for watching.